Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. Welcome back to Disclosure Team, everybody. I'm here for an exclusive interview with Mr. Danny Sheehan. Joining me today is my good friend and co host, Victor Vigiani. First of all, let's bring in Victor. Victor, how are you? Just fine. Just fine, Vinny. It's great to be with you. Thanks for this opportunity. Oh, it's, it's my uh, pleasure. It's, it's very important that we do this kind of thing. Important work, for sure. Absolutely. And let's not waste any time. Let's bring in our guest for today. Danny Sheehan. Danny, Danny, how, Danny are how are you? Terrific. Thank you Thank so you much, so for, much doing for doing this. this. So, so, I think, Victor, you're <laughs> you want to ask the first question? Yeah, well, yeah, just well, uh, once again, Danny, it, it is really great of you to be with us. We we caught your interview uh, with Jordan, Jordan Peace, and nah. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was it was, it was a great really time. Great it really time. was. Uh, I was uh, very happy with how Jordan managed everything. It was, uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah Jordan's getting better and better at MC. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you know, let's uh, let's sort of um, start with something that I guess is it's sort of an overarching kind of situation uh, in in Washington D.C. with uh, with the Schumer Amendment. Uh, it's something that has we could never have predicted this even five years ago, Danny, uh, as to how it came about with respect to what Chuck Schumer has done and his his amendment to the uh, to the National Authorization Act. Do you want to sort of just Give us a bit of a, a background. I just have some questions about sure. it as to like, where it came from. Sure. But just overall, very quickly, your assessment of, A, what Schumer has done and how it's going to impact how things evolve over the next uh, year and a half. Well, this, you're, you're, you're correct, Victor. This is extraordinary, uh, what's happened here. Uh, this has all eventually uh, spun out of the, uh, the decision on the part of Lou Elizondo uh, and uh, Chris Mellon, as we all know, uh, back in uh, October of 2017 to actually come forward uh, and talk to the New York Times and to provide to the New York Times the uh, gun camera footage uh, of the F-18 Hornets, uh, of the, of the Tic Tac in the Fast Walker and the Gimbal uh, UFOs. Uh, and this, this really began a uh, kind of a sea change in the entire uh, community of uh, all of us that have been working for uh, 50 years now uh, to try to uh, to get this information made more and more public and confirmed. The bottom line is is that 
uh, Lou Elizondo, who was the uh, director of the, uh, uh, the top secret program inside the Pentagon called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, uh, got totally frustrated over the fact that he was being not only blocked out of uh, access to the highest level information about the UFOs that we possessed in the government, but he was actually being lied to. Uh, but more importantly, he was upset about the fact that the, that the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies were lying to the, not only the American public, but they were, they were lying to Congress uh, and lying even to presidents and secretaries of defense, uh, denying that they had any kind of a program going to investigate UFOs, and more importantly, denying that they had ever had any uh, recovery of any kind of a UFO craft. Uh, and so the, 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 the bottom line is, is that that, uh, that uh, coming forward by Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, who was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, intelligence for both uh, Bill Clinton, President Clinton, and for President George W. Bush, he joined with Lou in bringing forward this information. And so they ended up being on 60 Minutes and other places and being interviewed uh, all over the country and all over the world uh, about this. And what happened is the, the Congress of the United States, I think, got caught a little bit flat-footed and they were embarrassed. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't suspect. Uh, indeed, some of them were quite certain that our American government was engaged in a process of trying to recover uh, such craft and to back engineer them. Uh, but they did, wouldn't talk about it. They always thought that the, the ridicule factor was too high uh, for elected officials and they would not ever do anything about this. And so what happened is they, when, when Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon began talking to the New York Times and began talking to 60 Minutes and other uh, programs like that, uh, the, the Congress was embarrassed that, that they were, had been so effectively lied to all this time uh, and that, uh, that no one seemed to be doing anything about it. And so they came forward, led actually by Marco Rubio, uh, who at that time, when the Republicans were still in charge of the Senate, was the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and he was also, of course, the United States Senator for Lou Elizondo, <laughs> who uh, comes from Florida uh, and is out of that uh, Cuban refugee uh, community that is such a powerful political influence in Florida, where Rubio is the senator. And so he came forward, and as Rubio began looking into this information, he became more and more shocked uh, and stunned at the information that was really available. Uh, and since he then had security clearances as the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon were able legally to share more information with him. And so he's the one and his staff started leaning forward inside the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, and to, to do something about this. And, uh, and uh, Rubio brought on the ranking Democrat uh, in the Senate Intelligence Committee, Mark Warner from Virginia. And so even when the Democrats took over uh, control of the Senate in 2020, uh, there was still this consensus between uh, both Rubio as the Republican and Mark Warner, the, the Democrat, uh, who are the two co-heads of the Intelligence Community, or the Intelligence Committee, to go after this information. Uh, and the first thing that they did was they drafted a bill which uh, set up a new office, a joint program office between the United States Defense Department and the Director of National Intelligence, uh, which they called the, uh, the anomalous, uh, the all domain anonymous uh, uh, phenomenon resolution office, <laughs> Arrow, they call it. Uh, and Sean Kirkpatrick uh, got appointed to be the head of that. Now, this was the first step. Uh, and what that office did is it made itself available for anyone who had top secret or above clearance that knew about the UFO program uh, and knew about the efforts to back engineer this and knew about the potential access that we had to information about the occupants of these UFO vehicles, uh, potential uh, specimens of bodies that had been recovered, et cetera, that, that uh, all, all of this information 
was then going to be made available to come forward to the aero office if there were whistleblowers. Now this had to do with live individuals who had top secret or above security clearances. They had a place to come to uh, and the provision that was passed by the, the Senate and by the House and by Congress uh, back in 2022, this gave authority to them to, to surmount their security clearances uh, and their prohibitions against telling anybody about what they knew. And they were then authorized to come forward and tell the Aero Office about the information. Now, that, that statute did not include mandating that any of the uh, intelligence agencies or military services or anybody were required to come forward. And it didn't require them to cough up any of the documents or any of the proof of all of this. But it did just offer a pathway uh, for whistleblowers to come forward. Now, what, what's happened now with the Schumer bill uh, is that the, the, uh, the people in the Intelligence Committee realized that a lot of the people who had the, the most important information and a lot of the documents revealing this program, this, this crash recovery program uh, and biological uh, evidence analysis program, that uh, they were afraid still to come forward to talk to Arrow. Uh, they didn't trust uh, the personnel at Arrow. Uh, and so what they did is they began going around Arrow and going directly to the Senate Intelligence Committee, <laughs> uh, realizing that they had the security clearances necessary, and they started communicating the information to the Senate Intelligence Committee. And so the Senate Intelligence Committee realized, Rubio realized, Mark Warner realized, and uh, Kristen Gillibrand uh, realized, the senator from New York, uh, they, they realized that there was an additional need to actually pass legislation mandating that the different military services, the six different military services that we have in the United States, you know, the Army and Air Force and uh, Marine Corps and uh, Coast Guard and now the U.S. Space Force and others, that they were going to be required to bring forward all the information that they've ever acquired. Uh, pertaining to the UFOs uh, and the ETs or extra dimensional life that they believe are behind the UFOs, mm -hmm. that they're, they're going to be mandated by the statute to turn this over to the government. Uh, and they're going to be uh, also including all 18 intelligence agencies, not just the CIA and the NSA and the DIA and the others that people have come to know about, but others that people don't have any idea about. There are 18 of these intelligence mm -hmm. agencies that include things like the geospatial uh, intelligence uh, agency and others that no one's ever even heard of. Uh, and the CIA has a major sur special surveillance program uh, operating, monitoring the UFOs, uh, et cetera. And so these are all now going to be required to turn over all the information uh, to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, mm -hmm. And thirdly, and very importantly, uh, all of the U.S. government military contractors like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and others that are very well understood to be in possession of some of these, uh, the, the technology from the downed UFO uh, craft, uh, that they also are going to be mandated to turn over all this information uh, to the Senate Intelligence Committee. And very importantly, in the Schumer bill, there is a provision exercising eminent domain on the part of the United States government taking ownership of any and all physical materials and technology that has ever been recovered from any of these uh, uh, UFO crash retrievals uh, and any of the biological evidence about this uh, non-human intelligence species that are piloting uh, and, and navigating these craft. So this, this new bill, the Schumer bill, uh, is, is actually for the first time ordering these, these uh, government entities and commanding these government contractors to turn over the information to Congress. Uh, and what this bill does, and this becomes uh, the center of the whole bill, is it uh, orders the establishment of a new uh, records review board uh, based on the Kennedy, JFK Kennedy assassination documents review board that was set up to review documents that were being withheld 
by the CIA and other government agencies pertaining to the Kennedy assassination, that they, they ordered the extraction of all of this information and put it into the hands of a nine-person board, uh, a UFO or UAP uh, records review board. Uh, and they were, not only that, but they were empowering uh, this board to release uh, information to the American public. Uh, and, and I'll mm. give you a couple, just a couple quick ones that one of them is, is that this board is uh, mandated by the statute uh, if it remains the way it is now when it passes through the House. OK, uh, this is the Senate version that it uh, it mandates that the board publicly release within 180 days of receiving it any information pertaining to the UFO phenomenon or the, the non-human non intelligence behind the UFOs, uh, that any information obtained prior to 1998, that's 25 years ago, any information that's been retained or obtained by any of those agencies or entities has to be turned over to the public within 180 days of the panel uh, having received it. Now that's an extraordinary provision uh, that's in there. Uh, and then what it says is that with regard to the more recently acquired information from 1998 forward to the present time, the board has to review all of that information and they have to release all of that to the public uh, over a period of time uh, that is going to be undertaken pursuant to what they call specifically, and you're gonna love this title, is that a controlled disclosure campaign plan that they are mandated by the statute to create, to actually create a controlled disclosure campaign to reveal all of that information to the American public and of course, therefore, to the world. Uh, unless, unless the providing agency uh, explicitly insists upon postponing the public release of a particular piece of information, which has to be approved by this board. Uh, and if the board doesn't approve of that request, they are required to make it public. Uh, and if they agree that they ought to at least temporarily postpone the immediate release of this information uh, for reasons which they specify in the statute, uh, that that information will go into what they call a postponed category. Uh, and then the information that is in that postponed category has to be released to the public pursuant to the controlled disclosure campaign plan. Uh, now, this is extraordinary. Now, now you might, people might wonder why this is a, so forward-leaning. Uh, it is because the, the Congress has become really pissed off uh, over the fact that they've been publicly embarrassed now uh, by the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies by uh, being so publicly exposed as having not having done anything about this for 75 years. And so what they've done now is they're trying to make up for lost time and they're leaning forward heavily into this to extract all of this information and to make sure that it is all put into the hands of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. Now, it also has this, this at least, uh, I, I might call it pastiche, <laughs> this, this kind of overall suggestion that it all has to be released ultimately to the American public. I think that's more for political consumption purposes than anything else, mm -hmm. because it has this caveat in it that allows the agency that has the information to specifically request that its, that its uh, public disclosure be postponed. Uh, and you can imagine they're all, every single one of the agencies and every single one of the, the private corporations that have this information are gonna try to shoehorn into that exception <laughs> virtually every single piece of information <laughs> they've got. Uh, yeah. and so we, we all know that. And so what we've done is we've set up the New Paradigm Institute uh, our Romero Institute, uh, which many of you know about, uh, and uh, that is the progeny of our old Christic Institute out of Washington, D.C., that did the Iran-Contra major investigations, that did the Karen Silkwood investigations, 
you know, we did the Three Mile Island case. Uh, we're known for uh, having very aggressive investigations that then litigate the questions and get judicial rulings mandating that the American public be uh, given access to some of these illegal covert operations that are going on, like this one. Okay, and so that we have set up this special new paradigm institute, which is a wholly integrated auxiliary office of our Romero Institute. Uh, and we've now got offices in Washington, D.C. We've actually been given offices, the only civilian office inside the federal enclave uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, the, our office is immediately next door to the Russell Senate Office Building and the Hart Senate Office Building. Uh, next door to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and we are the, we have been designated in the statute uh, as one of the agencies that is authorized to nominate people for this nine person board. And so we have reached out to other 501c3 organizations, public interest organizations, uh, two principal ones to begin with, to try to prepare a, a consensus uh, list of nominees, uh, and uh, we've had some negotiations with them. Some of them are a bit more conservative than our uh, New Paradigm Institute, but we've co we've come up now with a list of nine primary uh, nominees. Uh, they include people like Leon Panetta and John Podesta, others that you might uh, recognize uh, right away. Uh, but the statute, on the face of it, the Schumer bill actually requires that there be certain categories of people among these nine people, mm -hmm. such as a professional historian uh, and professional physicist uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, intelligence uh, people uh, and State Department people, okay? Uh, and so we have, using that criteria, come up with the, a list of our primary nine nominees uh, that we have included. Uh, uh, and we are submitting that to President uh, Biden uh, per the authority of the Schumer statute, okay? Uh, and so that, that's sort of the status of where things are right now. But of course, you realize, and everybody listening here today realizes, that we're still going forward presenting witnesses to Congress. Uh, and uh, as of recently, of July 26th, uh, just a couple months ago now, uh, David Grush, who was the representative from the, uh, the National uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency to the Office of Naval Intelligence Task Force on UFOs. He testified in open hearings now under oath uh, that we were in possession of a fully intact extraterrestrial non-human spacecraft uh, and biological remains of some of the occupants. Now, this has caused quite a stir, as you might guess, that this has now been made public. Uh, I met, uh, and I've been in regular communication with David Grush for almost two years now, uh, and that, uh, that I then met with uh, members of the House Oversight Committee, actual full members of the, the full committee, and we are in the process of arranging getting information to them in their classified status of exactly where these UFOs are being kept uh, and who the people are that have been working on the reverse engineering. So that process is underway as we speak. Uh, did, so did, I'm, that's yeah. what I'm doing. Did, did, just before I throw it over to, to Vinny, that's a great overview uh, because it's really important that people watching and listening to this, Danny and Vinny, that this is a, a severe educational curve that everyone is on right now it's, it's incremental and what you've outlined is indeed very very specific as to what comes next just very quickly how did schumer come about this did it did he just draw it out of the blue was he prompted where did this all come from in, in schumer's mind did harry reed influence him where did it come from well as, as most of us know harry reed has when he was the senate majority leader uh, that preceded Schumer, uh, was very interested in this particular issue. Uh, and he was responsible uh, back in 2007 for actually getting uh, $22 million uh, appropriated to finance a project under the Defense Department 
uh, which was the Advanced Weapons uh, Special Access Program. Now, that, that raises an extraordinarily important point here, and that is, is that up until this time, one of the reasons why the national security state apparatus here in the United States has been so secretive about this entire issue is they've been trying to back engineer the technology from these recovered UFO craft uh, so that they can make weapons out of it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the old Sufi saying that when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Uh, it's so that the, the people from the military establishment, the national security state infrastructure, when they first encountered these, these UFOs, uh, they immediately set up this super secret organization uh, to, to keep control of this because they were after the technology, because they wanted to build weapons. Now, all during the period of the Cold War that was going on, from the, and, and the, the major spate of these observations of the UFOs, as you know, really began in July of 1945, uh, setting aside the Foo Fighter information. And that was because they started appearing all around Alamogordo in the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico, where the, where the United States was planning to detonate its first atomic bomb. Uh, and when we detonated our first atomic bomb test, these UFO sightings started to increase dramatically around that area. Uh, and, uh, and then when we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, in August of uh, 1945, uh, this increased dramatically. And the first most famous of all uh, crash retrievals uh, that occurred in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, in 1947, in July, occurred right around the 509th bomber uh, base, which was the only base in the entire world where they had nuclear weapons. So there's been this heavy corollary or correlation between the interest of the UFOs uh, in their appearances and our use of nuclear weapons on our planet. Uh, and so ironically, uh, but unfortunately not coincidentally, uh, our national security state has been responding by trying to figure out how to make weapons like nuclear weapons, uh, but only more so using the technology of the UFOs. So that this, is, this has been a very serious problem uh, and so the, the, now that the Cold War is over, uh, theoretically, one might have expected uh, the national security state to lighten up on this, uh, but they haven't, uh, because what they've done is they've thrown down on uh, the withdrawal of the Soviet Union from the 75-year Cold War with the United States, uh, and have moved into trying to establish what they call, by their own terms, full-spectrum dominance over the planet. Uh, and they view access to this special technology as a major means by which they can exercise full spectrum dominance over the planet. Uh, and so that we have a, a major pushback going on uh, against all of us who are trying to get this information made more public and allow our people to come into the conversation about how we're going to relate to the actual occupants of these UFOs. Uh, of actually trying to understand that this is not just a weapons development question. Uh, this is a, an extraordinarily uh, important watershed in the entire history of our human family for us to really become aware of the fact that we are not only not located at the geophysical center of the entire universe, which we've been informed rudely about by Galileo and Copernicus uh, 500 years ago. But it turns out that we're not even at the apex of the pyramid of all sentient life in the universe. We're not the only source of sentient intelligence in the whole universe. And this is a major uh, shock that's coming to a lot of the people. Uh, and so that what we have to do is we have to go through a process of developing not only the means of getting the information shared with the people, but we have to also at the same time, which our new Paradigm Institute is doing, working on designing a fully uh, uh, comprehensive new human worldview that really takes into account the reality of this extraterrestrial civilization, uh, the members of which appear, many of which appear to be many thousands of years in advance to, to us. Uh, uh, not only technologically, but probably in many other ways. 
uh, and they may have the uh, answer to all kinds of secrets uh, that our human family are still struggling with. Uh, that are viewed as metaphysical questions or theological questions or philosophical questions, uh, economic issues that they've been able to resolve in their cultures. So these are things that are going to be of extraordinary importance, and that's why our new Paradigm Institute that is right at 110 Maryland Avenue, right on 1st Street, right across from the Capitol Building, uh, we're going to be working on all of those things in addition to bird-dogging uh, not only the military services to make sure that they cough this up to the intelligence community, uh, but also the intelligence services need to be pressured to turn the information over to the Congress, to the intelligence uh, committees. Now, so we're not only bird dogging this whole process and trying to get as much information out as we can to the American people uh, so that we can all participate in these profoundly important questions uh, of the, the philosophical and theological questions that are posed to us uh, by the discovery of, of this extraordinary reality. But we're also organizing with the major churches and religious organizations throughout the world to come on board. We're in the process right now of trying to convene a major summit conference among all the world religious leaders uh, to, uh, to have them brought together to discuss what we're all going to do about this. Uh, what kind of amendments need to be made uh, in some of the more parochial and limited perspectives on uh, the, the, the spiritual experience uh, that our human family has and how that relates to the consciousness of this extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional uh, uh, species that we're dealing with here. So that's it. So the, the bottom line is the reason that Schumer has agreed to co-sponsor this whole bill is because they want to make it clear that this is an institutional demand on the part of Congress uh, over and against the, the operatives of the national security state buried kind of deeply in the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies that the time has come for them to cough up this information uh, to Congress and allow Congress to make a decision as to how much of and when this information is going to be uh, provided to the people. You mentioned in there, Danny, about the nuclear connection. And David Grush, in a recent interview, brought up the Manhattan Project and the Atomic Energy Commission. So to what extent do you think the Department of Energy have been involved with the UFO subject over the years? Oh, very much. Yeah, I mean, the, there, there's, there's, they've been invoking the, uh, the uh, super secrecy around the technology of nuclear weapons, which everyone might very reasonably expect, you know, that you can't go publishing how you build a nuclear weapon or, you know, that, so that, that, that when, whenever we've discovered that we've granted the, the authority of national security state people to protect something, they always start cheating uh, and they start sliding into that category other things. Uh, like, for example, you give, you give the National Security State people the authority to, uh, to monitor telephone conversations of people that are engaged in terrorism, uh, and all of a sudden you find out that they're wiretapping everybody uh, because they've now gotten the technical ability to do it, uh, and then they start lying about it. Now, so so the, the problem that we have right now with this National Security State here in our country uh, is that we have to start carving back against the authority that they have co-opted over the past 75 years. You know, we really have to do that. Now, a lot of people think that one of the major motives for creating the National Security Act of 1947 uh, was to protect this unique secret of the UFOs and things. That's not really true. I mean, you know, this impetus to create the, uh, the CIA in the national security state uh, started well before Roswell. Uh, and it started uh, well before the detonation of the nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a continued uh, effort on the part of a very uh, select elite inside our country uh, to dominate the decision making uh, of our country. Uh, and this is still going on and we have to push back against this. And so this is going to be part of the dynamic that's going on here. The, that element is going to be trying to retain these secrets uh, and they're going to view the effort on the part of the New Paradigm Institute, which is going to be leading, in a sense, the 501c3 public interest effort 
to secure this information and to make it available to the public, that uh, they're going to be trying to characterize us as enemies of some kind, uh, that, that we don't care about the national security of the United States, that we don't care about the threats that may be posed by Russia or China or you know, whoever the newest adversary is, whether it's you know, Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein or you know, Grenada you know, this week. You know, the, the, it's an inclination of the national security state to to want to have some ultimate other, uh, and of course, the extraterrestrial species or species are the absolute dream of the national security state. Uh, if they can get people frightened uh, of this of this these species and this extraterrestrial civilization, uh, they think that they're home free to be able to do anything they want to do. And, and take as much of the tax money as they can possibly get their hands on to create a whole new uh, generation of weaponry uh, and surveillance against them. And you know, we have to push back against that. And so the New Paradigm Institute is going to be working on that as well. So it's, and that's why we've, we've gotten our offices right on Capitol Hill inside of the federal enclave where we can have regular daily uh, access to and communication with all of the staff members of all of the, the pertinent committees in the House and Senate uh, and uh, with the White House when we have sympathetic administrations uh, to lever this information and get it out to the people and to participate in facilitating and promulgating these public conversations about this issue and what kind of relationship we want to have with the extraterrestrial civilization now that we've reached the, the shore uh, of this great sea of outer space. You, you've had um, a lot of commentary on your own, Danny, about this whole issue of, you've mentioned it already, about national security and how, what I'm going to call it a ruse for now, but um, this whole thing about national security and whatever anything does come out, uh, they fall back on, no, we can't tell you because it's national security. Uh, right. Could you talk to us a bit about the idea that what is the national security interest here, and is this ruse unconstitutional? Well, one one of the one of the uh, important features of the Schumer bill that we're talking about here is it sets forth some extremely narrow and very specific uh, factors that can legitimate the the postponement of the revelation of any particular piece of information. Uh, that relates to the UFOs and the, the extraterrestrial species. Uh, for example, that if there's a, a particular piece of information, the revelation, the public revelation of which would expose some uh, major uh, confidential source that they have uh, that might be physically in danger uh, if their, their name is exposed. For example, that's one of the examples. And that I don't disagree with that. But I, I had the great advantage of being one of the key uh, attorneys for the New York Times during the Pentagon Papers case, in which the administration argued that uh, if any of the information in any of the 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers were released to the public, uh, that it would cause uh, uh, irreparable damage to the national security of the United States. Now, I made the argument to begin with that you know, the United States Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Gorin from back in 1945 explicitly designates the national security of the United States to be inherently overbroad uh, and inherently vague so that for all constitutional purposes, you can't do that. You can't just wave a national security flag at somebody and say, oh, we have a right to restrict any of this information for national security reasons. And then when I said to uh, Whitney North Seymour, who was the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, that was representing the Nixon administration at that time in 1971, when we had the Pentagon Papers fight uh, on behalf of the New York Times, you know, when he said, well, you know, there's information here that if you release it, it's going to cause irreparable damage to the national security of the United States. I said to him, like what? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, we can't tell you because you don't have the adequate security clearances. And then so Judge, uh, Judge Marie Gerfine, we were in chambers, and Judge Marie Gerfine turned to him and he said, well, what about me? You can tell me what it is. If you're here asking for an injunction against the New York Times to keep them from publishing this, you ought to at least be able to tell me what you think the danger is. Uh, and what you know, Seymour said, no, I'm sorry, Your Honor, we can't tell you either. 
uh, because you don't have the adequate security clearances. You know? And so, so that, that's the attitude on the part of the national security state, that the people aren't entitled to the information, the judicial system isn't entitled to the information, and up until this time, they've maintained that Congress isn't entitled to the information. And they've maintained, as we all well know, that even presidents are not entitled to this information. For example, back in 1976, in November, uh, November 19th of 1976, after Jimmy Carter had been elected president, he called in the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, who at that time happened to be George H.W. Bush, uh, and, uh, and demanded access to the UFO information because P Carter had seen a UFO. And so he knew that they were real and he wanted to get at it. And uh, George Bush refused to give him the information saying that the president had no need to know that information. Uh, so, I mean, the, the arrogance of the national security state people is, is beyond measure. Uh, and so that we have, to, we have to come to grips with that, okay? And uh, the, one of the reasons why Lou Elizondo contacted me and asked me to be his attorney in coming forward to the New York Times and sharing all this information is because of my having to represent the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case uh, and other serious investigations we've done, like the Iran-Contra investigation. We're the ones that filed the federal criminal racketeering charges uh, against the off-the-shelf enterprise, conducted the major investigation, which forced the Congress of the United States to hold public hearings about them, led to the appointment of a special prosecutor, and, and generated the indictment of half a dozen of the top officials in the Reagan-Bush administration and would have in fact, would have in fact uh, generated the indictment of more of them if it hadn't been for the fact that George Bush Sr., who had now ascended from the head of the CIA to being president of the United States, pardoned the first six people that we got indicted uh, for that. So I've, I've had a long history of working in these particular areas and we're hoping that that kind of experience and that kind of credibility will bring people to the New Paradigm Institute, uh, trusting us to be able to do a thoroughly good faith job of getting access to this information and making it available. While at the same time, I might add, I was the one who was briefing uh, then uh, chairman of the, of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, Joe Biden, uh, all about the Iran-Contra information that we had. So that I was making sure that the Congress was fully informed about this. And so I'm perfectly aware of the fact that, that to some extent, uh, our Christic Institute, the Romero Institute, and now our New Paradigm Institute, will be trusted by elected government officials, uh, such as those in the House Oversight Committee, uh, in the House Intelligence Committee, you know, in the Senate Intelligence Committee, to be responsible uh, in conducting ourselves, you know, in exposing this information. We're not going to be trying to flog, you know, the, the home telephone numbers of people who are confidential sources uh, to, to, on, on this UFO information, you know. Uh, and so one, one of the questions we all have to discuss is, you know, what are the limitations, if any, on what information can be made public so that we can put the pressure on to get that information released? I think at the present time, the narrow standards, most of them, that are in the Schumer bill are perfectly acceptable. Uh, but some of them are not. For example, they have, they have a provision in there that one of the grounds on which the uh, proffering agencies of this information can uh, adv ad advocate that it be prohibited from being publicly released right away is because it impinges on or infringes some national security interest. No, I mean, that's just inherently overbroad and completely vague and overreaching. And that has to be, that has to be amended. You know, we, we, are, we can't allow that. Uh, uh, and for that reason, I have recommended uh, certain people that will have to remain confidential for the moment because I don't want to embarrass them, that we're reaching out to as constitutional scholars to be part of this board, uh, this review board, because they're going to be charged with designing the the controlled disclosure campaign uh, and so that we want them to be you know taking into full account the constitutional presumption that our people are being involved in knowing about these things so that we can make democratic decisions about what we're going to do about this extraterrestrial civilization and how we're going to relate to it okay and so that this is these are all extraordinarily important things and that this issue of 
the overreach of the national security state is going to be part of this, you know. And so even though we have some people like Leon Panetta uh, and John Podesta and others that have been part of the national security state apparatus, you know, that they're in, in the committee, they, they may advocate, you know, for an over uh, broad interpretation of what can be uh, prohibited uh, temporarily or postponed. But uh, we'll have other people on the committee who can rationally and persuasively and thoroughly responsibly uh, advocate a more extensive release of this information. Uh, and that's going to be the major dynamic that the New Paradigm Institute is have to, going to have to try to oversee and, and bring in our American people and the people of the world uh, to participate in that conversation. Yeah. And with the recent focus, you know, on the revelations that David Grush brought forward on crash retrieval programs, I wondered if you could just take us back, Danny, because in previous interviews in the past, you talked about these photographs that you were witness to oh, in yeah. the Library of Congress. I just wondered if mm -hmm. you could kind of lay out that story for us again and, and, and what it contained. Sure. sure. That uh, back in, uh, as I mentioned, back in, uh, in November of 1976, immediately after President Carter was elected, uh, and he he reached out to the head of the CIA, George Bush Sr., and, and, and demanded access to the UFO information and was denied that information. What President Carter did was he went to the House of Representatives, to the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Representatives, and had them contact the Congressional Research Service uh, and have them conduct a special investigation and research on the question of UFOs uh, and their potential relationship to extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and I was contacted right away once that, that study began uh, by Dr. Marsha Smith, who was the head of the Science and Technology uh, Division of the Congressional Research Service and was asked to serve as special counsel uh, to that investigation, primarily because she, I, I was legal counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters in their uh, National Social Ministry Office at the time. Uh, and she thought that, correctly, that I would have a much better chance of getting access to the Vatican archives uh, to see if we could get the information from the Vatican archives to share with President Carter. And so I was in that capacity, and in that capacity, I was, uh, it turns out, was given access to the classified portions of Project Blue Book. Uh, and uh, those, those files were brought into Washington. They brought them to the Madison Building, uh, the new extension at that time in the spring of 1977, uh, that no one was even in the building. It was brand new. Uh, and so I, I was one of the first ones in to the building uh, after it was constructed. Uh, and that was where they brought the files. And so I went in to, to there to be shown these files. And uh, in searching through the files, I discovered photographs uh, of active uh, UFO crash retrieval operations. Uh, and I could see them. Uh, and here, here was this uh, absolutely transparently obvious UFO, you know, complete saucer, you know, uh, 30, 40 feet wide, you know, a big dome on the top of it that has skidded across this snow covered field and lodged in the side of this big uh, embankment. Uh, and you could see U.S. Air Force personnel all around it. Uh, taking photographs of it, and, uh, and they had a movie camera with a little, uh, two little uh, pods on the top of it, uh, those little canisters, you know, so this is like in the mid-50s or something. Uh, and so once I, once I saw that, I, I said, wow, this is, uh, and I could see that there were these unique symbols, like uh, along the bottom of the dome of this. And so I actually physically traced these uh, onto the, into a yellow pad that I had, uh, uh, and brought it back to Jesuit headquarters. Uh, and when I showed it to my Jesuit superiors, uh, that uh, one of them, uh, Father William J. Davis, actually, was my superior at the time, and I was, I was a candidate for the, the Jesuit priesthood at the time, uh, you know, he reached into his desk and pulled out an envelope and handed it to me, which had a, a photograph of a UFO in it. I mean, a eight and a half by 11 glossy black and white photograph. And I asked him where he got it, uh, and he said that his sister, Doty gave it to him. And I said, you know, well, where did she get it? <clears throat> he said, well, her husband, Mike, is the air traffic controller at the Seattle airport. And one of his best friends is a commercial pilot that flies freight all around the Northwest. 
he took this photograph out of the window of his airplane. <clears throat> and he didn't want to get in trouble. Uh, and so the pilot, once he got it developed and saw what he had, uh, he didn't want to report it uh, for fear they might take his license away. And so he brought it to his friend, who was the head of the air traffic controllers <clears throat> in Seattle. And then Mike didn't want to get in trouble. So he brought it home to his wife, Dodie. <clears throat> and he said, here, Dode, you know, give this to your brother. He's a priest. <laughs> right. Which, which uh, is, a, is an extraordinarily revealing story because it means that a lot of the general population has sort of an instantaneous uh, fear of reporting what they're seeing. But at the same time, they think that it has kind of intense religious overtones to it. Uh, and it's all true. Uh, and so uh, I, I then brought uh, a motion <coughs> before the National Council of Churches, uh, Washington Interreligious Staff, uh, to set up a task force. This is now the spring of 1977 to try to formulate a common set of principles that all of the major 52 uh, major religious organizations in the United States are going to come up with a common set of uh, policies with regard to how to respond to this. Uh, well, they declined doing that, uh, and so I've been at it ever since. Uh, and that we are now in dialogue with the Jesuit order, uh, you know, and that they are in they are charged with responsibility for reforming the the Catholic Church. Now, as you know, right now, uh, Francis, who's the first Jesuit ever to be elected pope, has called all the bishops around the world into Rome, uh, you know, and is engaged in a major synod right now. Uh, working on things, we're, in, we're going to be in communication with Francis and with, with Cardinal Peter Turkson, uh, the head of his, uh, former head of his uh, Pontifical Commission on Social Justice, to uh, get further uh, information from the church about what policies they want to adopt with regard to this. Uh, and then they're going to be reaching out to the Eastern Orthodox, to Kirill uh, in Moscow, to Bartholomew uh, uh, in uh, Constantinople. We're going to reach out to the Grand Mufti in, uh, in the Islamic community. Uh, the, we're, in, we're going to be in communication with the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, with Reverend Saperstein and others that we know. We're all trying to formulate a set of policies, you know, independent of those that the national security state thinks that we mm -hmm. ought to have so that we can formulate a set of policies and present them in the public discourse about this. Uh, so, so that's what we're engaged in, uh, among other things, at the New Paradigm Institute. Um, you, you sort of alluded to it earlier, and there's two things that, I, that I'd like you to flesh out for us. First of all, Danny, is you mentioned earlier uh, that you would be visiting the Vatican and so on and so forth, and that's a, a major move or an extension of what you've already done. Mm -hmm. And once all of this information uh, you know, moves through whatever machinations it does move through. And once the information does come forward and there is some sort of uh, iconic resolution as to what we can say and what we can't say, um, it, 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 is there a component of this information, the whole ball of wax, uh, that we should not know about uh, or that we might not want to know about? Does that, does that frighten you that there might be that kind of information within this whole uh, cadre of, inf of information? I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of that entire concept. You know, uh, that, that, uh, that I was the co-founder of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review at Harvard Law School and have been a major advocate of the First Amendment and freedom of the press and free speech. The, the entire underlying theories that have been articulated by people like Justice Brandeis and others in many uh, Supreme Court opinions is the general presumption is uh, that the American people have a right to have access to information uh, so that we can make democratic choices uh, about what policies our country is going to be promoting. It's a unique, a unique feature of the United States government. It's a, a unique contribution that the United States uh, has hopefully uh, contributed to the world. Uh, and that, uh, so that we're, we're therefore leaning very heavily in the direction of saying that, look, there, aside from things like publishing people's home phone numbers and you know, names mm -hmm. of confidential sources or, or, or how to build an atomic bomb, you know, there, there, there are some extraordinarily narrow criteria uh, that may well justify keeping some particular pieces of information uh, uh, secret, 
uh, longer. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the Schumer bill has actually identified some of those, as I've pointed out, that are extremely responsible and very, very narrow and carefully crafted. There are, as I've mentioned, however, a, a few times they kind of toss in these kind of more amorphous and overbroad and unconstitutionally vague uh, phrases uh, that the national security state is going to try to take advantage of. And so we have to try to expunge those from the, from the authority that they have. Uh, but the, 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 the ones that people think most often about uh, certainly don't qualify for that. Well, like for example, uh, if in fact it's confirmed from this information that at least one or more of these uh, species who, let's for the sake of uh, clarity, discuss th them being potentially extraterrestrial, uh, even though they may manifest in ways that appear to be extra dimensional from the way that they can appear and disappear, et cetera, which may be some kind of a subfunction of the means by which they transport. Uh, but the, the bottom line is, let's, let's assume that the information reveals that at least uh, one or more of these species has been engaged in an involuntarily uh, abducting uh, people, human beings, and involuntarily uh, subjecting them to physical examinations and uh, involuntarily subjecting them to the extraction of the uh, ovum uh, ova from women. Uh, and engaged in a, 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 a hybrid breeding program, involuntary program, actually replacing the, uh, the fertilized eggs that have been uh, subjected to, uh, to gene splicing back into the, to the womb of a human woman and, uh, and having her carry the child to partial term. And then, you know, this whole thing that we know about. Uh, if, if that were to be revealed, they might argue in the national security state, well, the people would become outraged and they would put pressure on us to have to, you know, mount military uh, or law enforcement e efforts against them to stop them from doing this. And that could be catastrophic in light of the superior uh, firepower they appear to have technologically. You know, and so therefore we can't tell you that, mm -hmm. you know, now that's that's mm -hmm. not supportable, uh, to be clear. Uh, and so that 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 I think we are among some of the more expert people in being able to counter those kind of arguments that they make because we've encountered them before <laughs> in a lot of completely unjustified settings. Uh, so we, we can make the argument, oh, look, at this is exactly what you said about, you know, the, the stuff in the Pentagon Papers. You know, this is exactly what you said, you know, when, when uh, uh, another, like in the Karen Silkwood case. Oh, you can't reveal the fact that the Kermagee Nuclear Corporation has been secretly smuggling 98% pure bomb-grade plutonium to Israel to make nuclear weapons with because that could interfere with our foreign policy with regard to Israel. You know, I said, well, then you should have thought about that before you did it, uh, you know? Uh, and so that we have got a long track record of some 50 years of direct experience in countering those kind of arguments in the forums that are important in which to do it. And so that's why we're, we're going to be doing it. So my, my general disposition is to resist any and all such attempts, uh, it, with the exception of those few very narrow exceptions that they've actually mm -hmm. identified in the Schumer bill, uh, to, to make sure this information is going to be made publicly available. And I will be advocating that uh, in my discussions with people on the House uh, Oversight Committee uh, and in the Senate Intelligence Committee and other places. And to whatever extent we can figure out how to do this, I will be advocating that to the members of this board, the, the Records Review Board. Now, we don't know yet exactly what protocols are going to be adopted by the board with regard to our New Paradigm Institute having access to make these arguments to them. Uh, we don't know what that is yet, but we, we will find that out. And to the extent to which our uh, office has been designated in the statute, as one of the eight agencies that can make recommendations for nominations, uh, we may have some more limited access to the, to the board to be able to make these arguments. I would hope so. Uh, and I would hope that uh, most of our people in our major community would be advocating that our New Paradigm Institute have such access in order to be an advocate for the people. We need to have a people's advocate at the table when those decisions are being made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, are there any contingencies or alternate paths forward if, 
you know, in a worst case scenario that the Schumer amendment is stripped or watered down by the time that it, you know, lands on the president's desk? Is there another path that, that we can take alternatively? Well, I'll tell you what, what we've, what we've adopted is that, hey, you know, it was a completely unanimous 17 to zero vote inside the Senate Intelligence Committee to approve the Schumer bill. OK, and I'm assuming that we're going to get something like that when it comes to the full floor of the Senate, since okay. the since you have complete leadership support for this. And when it goes over to the House side, uh, assuming the House is functional <laughs> at that time, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that you don't have Jim Jordan being the uh, the speaker of the House, you know, <laughs> and, and that, that you have some semblance of, of constitutional authority being exercised over there, that we should be able to get most of it through now. But. If for any reason steps are taken to try to water it down, our new Paradigm Institute is going to be continuing to conduct ourselves pursuant to the mandates of the Senate bill. Mm. Because we know that we have the complete support of the senators from both political parties, uh, and not only the leadership, but also the, the regular line members of the Senate uh, are, are also on board this thing. And so with that kind of political power at our backs, you know, we're going to be insisting that those criteria be the ones that are operational. And to the extent to which the board has discretion to determine what the protocols are that it's going to be following, we would strongly advocate that they follow those that were promoted and promulgated by the Senate, uh, since they have that kind of support. Uh, and so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but at, at the present time, our job is to get the people in the House, uh, such as uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Jamie Raskin, others who are on the House Oversight Committee, who deigned to come to the hearing, you mm -hmm. know, uh, when when uh, when Dave Grush and uh, and uh, Flavor and uh, and uh, Gary uh, uh, are all came to testify, uh, you know that that uh, we can we can organize and 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 support that kind of political backing uh, to get a, a strong bill uh, through the House and Senate. Uh, and I'm sure that, that President Biden is going to sign this. And, and I'm sure that he's going to give a careful consideration to the recommendations that we have made because we've gone to such lengths to make them clearly responsible uh, and responsive to the specific criteria that have been designated in the statute. Not, not sure how much time uh, more you have, Danny, but uh, we're reaching sort of the, the one hour point. Um, what, I'd, what I'd like to kind of broach with you um, as in terms of what I mentioned earlier, in terms of education of, of, of the citizenry, what advice would you have with all of this information raining down on us that's going on right now? I mean, it's like trying to trying to catch, uh, you know, 50, 50 apples at one time falling from a tree. Uh, what advice would you have for people to um, get a hold of this information and try to find out and make sense of all this. What do you think that the ordinary listener or viewer should be doing today to find out more about what the, the whole complex nature of what this issue is all about and what's happening? I, in, in I, I think they should be coming to the New Paradigm Institute. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, that's what we're there for. Yeah. I mean, our, our job is to correlate all of this information, uh, 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 compact it in such a way that it's in digestible pieces of information, uh, mm -hmm. put together uh, mini documentaries about particular issues that are involved in this, respond to people's questions. We're in the process of staffing up now. We're going to be putting up a, a much more sophisticated website uh, that we, ha we have a, a sort of a, a holding website up right now. Uh, but people will see where it is and they can communicate with us. They can contact us through the New Paradigm, New, New Paradigm Institute dot org, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and get it get it through to us. Uh, they could also reach us if they chose to do so through what, what they call the UAP Disclosure Foundation. Uh, that's the term that's used in the, the Schumer statute. Uh, that's us. We have the domain of that, the New Paradigm Institute, and it'll come right straight through to us. And so what, what we're, what we're uh, going to be doing is providing a service to the public. We're going to be kind of a special people's advocate, and that entails keeping our people well-educated and answering their questions, et cetera. Uh, and so that, that uh, people can contact us now, and we have our office set up. We have our office uh, manager and director that's on place, uh, Dr. James Garrison. Dr. James Garrison was my, uh, my deputy 
uh, dealing with nuclear disarmament issues at the Jesuit headquarters uh, when I was back there. Uh, he ended up meeting with President Gorbachev, was one of the ones who worked with Gorbachev to help persuade Gorbachev to step back from the Cold War. We've been actually at that level of conversations in the past here. Uh, and so he's capable of, of uh, carrying out a lot of our activities in Washington. Uh, I'll be there uh, approximately half time. I'm back and forth between here, there in California that you know, we teach every spring quarter out here at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And we have other issues. We have the Lakota People's Law Project going. We have a big fight going, you know, against the Dakota Access Pipeline up in North Dakota. Uh, we, we're trying to stop them from destroying native land where they're, they're uh, you know, mining on the land now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other projects. We're involved in getting legislation passed in California, which we just succeeded in getting legislation passed to consolidate all of the incentive programs for uh, poor and middle class people to be able to purchase electric vehicles. There's a lot of things that our Romero Institute is doing. That's why we have set up the new Paradigm Institute to focus exclusively on this issue. Uh, and have set up the office in Washington, D.C. to focus specifically on this issue so that we can give it full-time attention. That's fantastic. And I'll make sure that all the links, the relevant links to your organization and yourself are in the description of this video for anybody that wants to go and take a look. Well, Danny, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to speak with you. Uh, I really, really do say thank you. Terrific. Well, I, pre I appreciate the opportunity. And I always love talking to you, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> This is the great. feeling is the feeling is mutual, and, and wh while I do have you on 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 set, and you mentioned this several times already, the People's Advocate. If you haven't read this book, boys and girls, uh, go out and buy it. It doesn't deal just with the UFO issue; it deals with a lot of things that I think people interested in this issue uh, will, will want it, will want to know about. So it's the People's Advocate. Uh, written by Daniel Sheehan. So I just thought I'd mention that. I know you wouldn't do it, but so I did. <laughs> Terrific. I'll put the link to that in the description as well. Sure. Well, Victor as well. I really Thank appreciate you. you being here, Victor. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's so been great. Thank, thank you. you, gentlemen. I appreciate Th thank it. Thank you, Vinny. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Ter terrific.